Okay, today is November 7, 2021, and we're going to continue our West, our Extinction Naughty meeting, our Western meeting. And we'll start off with our um, efforts with the ARG. So the only thing I have is we have a scheduled uh, interview, um, interview with uh, Derek Jensen on Wednesday. So I'll post that. It's, um, it's going to be in the afternoon uh, Pacific time. But um, I'll, I'll post it for so everyone can make it. But uh, that's it on my end. Uh, so okay, yeah, yes, I'll go next. So yeah, the uh, the oh, the arg is is languishing. I don't, I don't um, I, I'm for some reason I'm not I'm not feeling the the drive to push it <laughs> um but so, so all the the ib stuff and the extension umbrella is they they all kind of seem out to lunch to me now they they you know in this uh, on this other track you know that's just um i kind of wonder what <laughs> what the end game is um because there's a disconnect of the, the, where we all think and we all, we're all doomers, but then the actions don't match the doom. So I don't know. I just feel, again, it's just like not the right time. The stars are not really aligned. Um, so I think, um, you know, we just carry on just preparing and just uh, what do other people think on that? I mean, I... I still think there's a lot to do in terms of just you know, pre prepping people and laying the ground for when people catch up with us. And so, yeah, I'm doing um, writing and uh, doing like a, a did I, did anybody like that comic that I did with <laughs> uh, yep. Elam Stark? Um, I think I'm. Yeah, of making a kind of a, a running thing out of it <laughs> and maybe try and do one a week or something like that. If, uh, if people, it's, it's a lot of work, but I think it might be nice to just have, uh, you know, kind of a base. Um, it might, you know, it just might uh, get people interested in, in coming along and uh, just, um, yeah, I, I still think we just do egregore building um, because you know the, this kind of world changing stuff is I I just can't quite see what people are trying to get to. I I'm, I must admit that I'm a little bit from it because my I think of uh, collapse as being kind of soon. Um, you know, five years, ten years time frame. If when people start talking about twenty fifty, I really think they're being delusional. And when they start talking about 20, you know, 2100, I think, oh, come on. <laughs> I mean, come on, I, I just pick up a newspaper. I just you're being, being idiotic. And then 2100 is, is so remote as, you know, it's just like it's not even worth talking about. Um, but, you know, I think already you're seeing collapse. We're seeing collapse before our eyes. And so we were in collapse and people are talking about you know, the civilization could collapse in in 10 years or by 2050. I so said, like, dudes, you can't see this. <laughs> We're at the limit of everything. It's collapsed for you, right? So I don't know. I don't feel like evangelizing and going out and telling people. I just feel like, you know, some stage we try to help people when they come along. So we have all the discussion. We have all the materials and stuff. That's that we've done and all the stuff we recorded and it's all there and people find us and go hey you know finally somebody that thinks the way we do, but it, it's important to do the thinking up front for people, um, so saying you know like ah, here's the kit, <laughs> you know, and then the kit, welcome to Doomerville we've got a Doomer kit, and so you have the eager eager born community so I'm all for building things up like the sigil I guess the sigil thing if everybody liked that sigil um i um so so greg did a, a take of it but i think it has to be vector graphics but i i i like that idea of getting a sigil and and in um investing it and stuff like that and 
um, hopefully um, Lionel and stuff will you know help us do that kind of stuff but I thought that kind of you know ritual and stuff and um, you know building up uh, really the kind of community and language kind of thing just really the the cultish aspects of it so really you know slow cult building um, I I feel you know everybody else has kind of gone you know gone off to lunch on this you know we, in six months we're gonna have a global revolution and stuff and it's like I'm not seeing this myself <laughs> I mean maybe I'm just reading it and the you know the youth comes out of cop and you know, goes wild and you know the maybe Greta turns into Joan of Arc and uh, but I, I think we have a long way from that you know people are making psychological progress they're making less progress than they're not even keeping up with the changes in the environment as far as I can see so it means that there's going to be an awful rush at some stage where people gradually realize <laughs> horrid doom of truth and then you know you want to be able to say well here's a bit of therapy and you know luckily um, you know you can join our party there we, we've all seen this coming for a long time and welcome <laughs> that's the way I see it um, I don't see I mean if you had a global revolution uh, you, you certainly want to you know do ecotage and do mass civil disobedience and stuff but I don't, I don't th I think that has to come in its time as it's, it's you know I don't think we can ferment it or spark it or anything like that you can just contribute to it like a whole lot of other people apart from that you know um, it just all these things have big players and a lot of resources and they just fringe so I think that yeah if everybody's happy then we just carry on doing what we're doing and pick away at it but um, we definitely on a different wavelength from all these other people and I can't get on their wavelength because they seem to be at odds with themselves you know <laughs> one moment they're saying yeah we're all doomed there's nothing we can do we should be doing deep adaptation and then it's like you know sitting in the road trying to get <laughs> trying to get people to change the the consumer habits and I was like what's consumer habits what's that got to do with anything it's way beyond consumer habits you know, if, if people are kind of in a time machine and they keep on like popping back to the 70s for a visit I mean I just posted something with Rupert Reed like you know he has a kind of a flash where you think okay he understands where things are at and then the next moment he's saying well you know I think we should lead in the universities by setting the curriculum and it's and the other guys got like He's an ice scientist and saying, yeah, it's all about education, like liberals, always education. It's like education is a 30-year endeavor. It's like we haven't got 30 years. What the hell? Ed education is irrelevant. But very soon these higher educational things will be falling apart because they're all part of the infrastructure and take a lot of money and there's about to be collapse and hyperinflation. And I think, you know, it's like, do you think all the educational system, you know, institutions led during the Great Depression or the collapse of 29 I don't think they had anything to do with it so current events are completely out of way right so that's the way I see it um, but what do you guys think well I have two questions is have you been in contact or do you intend to be in contact with with um, faulty um, and second is we can't neglect the the COVID uh, situation, uh, it has added, you see, it has, it has aggravated the wave uh, of, of problems associated with that as, as, as increased during 2021 at the moment where we were talking about the ARG. And I think there's a kind of a, I don't know, is it a distraction? Is it a, a fear? Is it, I can't put a name on it, it's happening in the public, but it's, uh, it's it's the um, the atmosphere in general is 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 not as you said the stars are not aligned at the moment for um, for what we want to do it seems like there's a there's a, there's this at the forefront what I, what, do you, what what are your thoughts on on this faulty yeah, and, and i think it's kind of like the obvious thing to do 
I think the obvious thing to do is is to try and develop something like the White Lotus Society and um, you know see to see like that in um, in China and uh, so that seems to me the kind of thing that you want to resilience and you know collapse um, and you know that it, you need to lead with the the egregore and the the mindset. And then all the actions follow. You can't lead with all the actions and then figure out what you're doing later. Um, so that's kind of what it went to with Fawlty. Is, is when I spoke to him, then everything was, you know, he accepted that, oh, you know, it has to be in America, it's fringe in, in England, and then, um, you know, it has to be some, you know, done on a large scale, and, you know, it has to be something, tactics have to be exportable. But then, uh, you know, I, it got to be where, you know, they completely just involved in doing the IP stuff. And then my heart sinks because the IP stuff is, is all about, you know, back to the future, where it's back to Selma and how there needs to be change. And then, you know, and change means well, all the scientists are going to sort it out. Is you know, we'll overthrow the government and start listening to the scientists. And it's like, Jesus, what planet's that? I mean, the, the scientists are corrupt. Sci science is not going to save you. So it's it's the whole. You know, I completely sold faulty on the idea that he's a cult leader and he should be. And then you know, we can show him how to be a cult leader. He seems to have reverted completely back to, you know, I'm an activist and civil rights and civil disobedience and it's all about Selma and, you know, overthrow the government in six months because that's what the cutting edge science says. And I thought, I thought, I thought we moved beyond all that. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's the same, it's the same with XR is they, they, they're being dysfunctional, you know, it's everything they're doing and they, is dysfunctional, but they're not being honest about it. They, they're not progressing. They're not progressing psychologically is, where it, is the problem. They're stuck in the mud. And so it, they're doing avoidance behavior as far as I can see. So XR put up a, this thing where they, there was this arms deal, this, this arms show in Britain. And so they blockade it, but then they didn't do their homework, and they said, well, it happens that the entrance they blockaded, there was also a, a jabs clinic. So they had, you know, so they, they couldn't tell the difference between the guy going to the arm show or the guys <laughs> going to get their jabs. So then, so then they had to, like, let the guys with the jabs through, and so then they let through everybody, and so they wound up putting this big tower and this effort in the road, and all these cars were driving past. So it was pointless. It wasn't a blockade. It wasn't anything. Everybody was just kind of laughing at them. And so then you see, yeah, IB and stuff is making tremendous progress. They're getting all in the news and even in, across the Atlantic. But the problem is to what end? It's it's all, you know, climate awareness, climate action. And you say, what action? No, Nobody's moving ahead to saying, you know, is it this, it's anybody's action work. It's like, What's your action? Oh, my action is solar panels and wind farms and stuff like that. And they say, like, you know, it's too late for all that shit. Then somebody else says, oh, it's nuclear. And then some other idiots, it's geoengineering. And so you're saying, like, well, what, what's all this activism for? I mean, where's it supposed to wind up in all these amazing things where, you, you know, we do all this human agency, and then what? We save this system? We keep, we keep this system going? It's like, where do you want to go with this? It's like, it, the, if people need to get to the point where they defect from the system. So I think it, it doesn't work with Audi because in a way, he still believes in the system. He's still believing that, you know, you can take over the instruments and institutions and reform them. So these guys fundamentally believe in the system and they reform it. And so I don't think we can do anything with them until they come to the conclusion that, no, this system is doomed, and we have to, you know, basically, you have to be accelerationist. Or, so, so in other words, we have this bizarre situation where the general public, the average youth, 
is psychologically ahead of the activists who's supposed to be on the leading edge. So, the, you know, my kids and their friends are making more psychological process faster than Greta and all these other people who are supposed to be leaders in protest. So, they, the the left still thinks, and these activists, the, they still think in terms of, yeah, there's, there's still stuff we can do. We can stop burning fossil fuel and we, we can reform the system and we can still have our cake and eat it and we still have our avocado toast. And they like, still haven't got to the epiphany that most kids are getting to, which is like, that th this isn't going to happen. <laughs> We're not going to live the life of our boomer parents. There's some serious shit coming down the road. And so, so yeah, it's this weird dichotomy where one moment will be said, you'll say the same picture, and then now the salute, the good news. And then it completely contradicts the, the picture, the, which I think is the true picture in the first half of everything he says. With this thing is now the good news. Well, we can do what they did in Selma and solve climate change. It's like, no, you just said we can't. <laughs> you just said we can't do that. And now, now you're going out recruiting people to do this mass movement, which is, <laughs> I can't see what the, the aim is. So, so he's gone off the whole thing, the whole, you know, it's kind of back to square one. It's like forgotten the arg, forgotten cults and, you know, forgotten uh, deep adaptation and, you know, so the, the primary thing is these guys are thinking in terms of being, um, you know, they should be reactionary, but they're thinking in terms of being revolutionary. And it's like, it's too late for a revolution. What, what's a revolution gonna achieve now? Uh, yeah, there's, there's only one thing to do, and that's to like throw, throw a spanner in the works. So you should, um, as far as I can see, the only way to do that is to build up an egregore, to build up people that you have a, a subculture that thinks that way. Um, so, so in the end of the day, we have a lot more in common with GDR and stuff like that than an accelerationists and the average dude than any one of these activists who, who you know, kind of stuck in the wrong decade. Yeah, so at this point, hmm, I agree. We, yeah, let's, it's good to continue the egregore. It's just, um, I think a few months earlier, we were looking to like Fawlty and his group as some something that can help progress it. But it sounds like we're it's diverging now. Or how do you see it? Yeah, I mean, I feel like, so, so, yeah. Yeah, he asked for a project plan, and um, so I did all the project plan, as all the project we agreed that, uh, you know, that, that, you know, he would do all this thing at the end of COP, then, you know, stuff which I can't really divulge, and then that would set things up for mid-next year, start in America, and, and then do it in terms of an ARG or something that translate um so i did all the project planning and stuff but it, it just kind of got more and more laborious to you know to move it along so that that's uh and you know and then you could completely see that ib is just takes all the time so so yeah it's just they're just uh distracted out to lunch on the thing so so i haven't you know, at the very least, if we want to carry on down that route, we, we have to wait till after COP, see what, what happens and and where they go with XR. Um, but yeah, I mean, all, all, all the things, there were a number of things we agreed and they they never materialized, you know, so things like on on Reddit and stuff to actually s sort out that problem. Um, and so it was absolutely agreed that they would do that. So 
then they need to do the file the complaints the complaints came back and they said nah we can't stop this guy you know <laughs> and so i needed some muscle um you know some and but they they didn't do it they just wanted me to do it so i i i since found out that well they they're a lot more disorganized than i thought i thought that they were quite organized to get these things together but i since found out that they uh, they're not exactly uh you know organized i mean considering that they are professional organizers they're not very organized <laughs> um yeah so yeah it's a it's a lot more ad hoc and um unprofessional and disorganized than than i thought um so so yeah so i guess what we should do is just wait till after cop and then then see but yeah in the meantime um i think uh yeah the, i'm kind of enjoying the things we're doing i, I I would like to do the, the, you know, the thing about uh, the podcasts and stuff like that. So it might be good to start developing those things on the sigil, and um, I'll do some cartoons and um, some writing. We carry on doing these videos on Sunday, and then, yeah, it's kind of a broadcast stage, I guess. <laughs> but the whole point in my mind is is. We're not even at the ARG stage. We're just building up the egregore. And eventually, you know, we may get to some place where we say, yeah, okay, there's a critical mass of people that want to do do something. And then I would say we start the ARG more formally. formally. But, yeah, you, you have to get something together and get a critical mass first before you know, people will start devoting time and stuff. So it's, and to do that, you have to be, you know, in the right place at the right time. So it's not, a, it's not about leading the charge. You have to serve what people want to do. And at the moment, people just want to crawl under a rock and die, as far as I can tell. <laughs> they're, not, they're not thinking in, you know, in terms of resistance or action. Yeah, but um, that, that seems to go with the question that RP has written there about uh, uh, totalitarianism in the West, because at the moment it seems like um, in the West uh, we're under this kind of uh, tyranny with the COVID thing, and and uh, and I think people's people's energy is 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 completely wrapped to, to taken up in in trying to put up with that, and from different angles, some people want it to be you know, to, to come back to normal, what they call normal. Some people are resisting, some people are, but it seems like there's a diversion and, 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 and um, yeah, your question is, would there be any efforts based on public resistance and demonstration and uh, with events in Australia will be a blueprint. I, I think that's at the root of why there is this kind of a reaction from XR2. It's like they're they're on they they have their heads in the sand and they found this insulate Britain thing so they're focusing on that they're totally dissociated at the moment there's a dissociation phenomenon going on and and I think it's major the major drive is this this kind of eerie situation with with the COVID and and I I think that's that's just when the ARG thing started to change too Do you know when we we were we were we were going quite full, full steam ahead, I would say, at some stage, and um, but it, it kind of it, it kind of, of stopped because at the same time when measures started to to to, to come up on, on on the COVID scene, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, definitely petered out. So I thought we were going to have a very busy year, um, you know, and really get launched in you know mid next year. But um, no, it's really petered out because uh, people are not uh, not motivated. So yeah, I mean, I think that the, the things like the demonstrations are avoidance behavior, the psychological avoidance behavior, because everybody knows they're useless. Everybody knows what they have to do. So it's kind of a way of just avoiding what the necessary thing is. So I think that, you know, you, 
you, ha you have to go through this period. It's kind of long drawn out, but it's the same behavior as, you know, people that need to study for an exam or something, and they go and tidy their room, and they start cleaning stuff and you know, doing all of that kind of thing because they don't want to get down and study. And so it's the same thing with the public. They know damn well what you have to do, but that's hard and it's dangerous and they cowardly. And so it's a, it's a substituting fake action you know, is a good way of avoiding genuine action. And I think that's what they're doing. They're avoiding genuine action with the uh, thing. But yeah, you can see everybody's got distracted. So you go through these times where, you know, it's kind of like the murmur, murmur of the birds. Um, uh, so, you know, what we offer people is an, a point of attraction. So it's, a, it's an attractor for people that think the, the same way. So the way these things go is it's kind of like the murmuring of the birds and stuff. And then they, you know, they come together and they just, uh, you know, disperse and then it oscillates. And then if, you know, it might never achieve anything or it might reach a critical mass. I mean, people say, yeah, these guys think the right way and are saying the right stuff. But at the moment, uh, we might as well be on a soapbox on a street corner. <laughs> you see, these, these times are always necessary because, you know, it's a, um, in any, you we. Really, it's really a catalyst for change, what we're doing is a catalyst for change. And in these times of ca for catalysts for change, like uh, big changes on a global uh, scheme, is the guys that actually can see where it's going, they are in the wilderness in these times. While the whole hive organizes itself and mills around and then still comes to a consensus on what it actually wants. So at the moment, we... we in this disorganized state as, as, as a globe, we, we know things are not working, we know we're being lied to, we know that gradually people are starting to realize that the, the situation is a lot worse than we thought, and no one's going to save us. All these rabbit foot uh, solutions, unicorn solutions, and ESG, and all, all these ephemeral stuff, solar panels and wind, wind farms and stuff, is you know, more and more people are starting to get at this. This doesn't do it, does it? So we need to get, you know, it's just needs time to expire before people say, you know, we're kind of screwed, aren't we? And they say, yeah. And say, what do you do now? And you say, well, <laughs> start in video number one in on my website and go through from there because we, you know, you can, you can uh, binge, binge, offer all the solutions. It's just um, expounding on them. Right? But So, yeah, I think, hope that answers the question. And so I just think that basically we just carry on like we are um, and just, just uh, wait for the world to catch up. <laughs> and because, oh, don't forget that it's, it's we here to serve other people. We're not here to get them to serve us. And so a lot, a lot of activists um, are really selfish. They, they, they want to save the world for themselves. And I mean, Greta is like, you know, you cost me my future and stuff. And uh, yeah, I don't think that's the way to be. It's like, you know, it's how, how do you, you know how it's going to turn out. They're all bigger than all of us and a lot more scary than most people think. So you have to think of yourself more, more passive and be more in an ambulance role. Start thinking of um, triage and helping with the bandages. But, uh, you know, it's my, I think where we're at is we should think more of nursing people <laughs> when, they, when they catch up. Um, yeah, because I don't see a lot of people providing this service. Everybody seems out to lunch. So, you know, the doomers are all kind of morbid and morose and stirring the doom into it excessively. They're kind of neurotic. And then the activists are all ADHD and diverting themselves. Um, the guys like um, a Deep Adaptation and Jim Bridal, they're all absolutely descending into narcissism. Um, and so, yeah, it's... 
there are not many people out there just saying like, hey, uh, are there any adults who you can actually get some help from? And I'd like to think, say, well, yeah, these these people are weird as hell, but <laughs> at least at least uh, you might get a bit of sanity. I, it's yeah. That that's the way I see it. If if anybody wants to do, you know, I had a people. To say like, oh no, we want to do something like, you know, break shit. Um, I'm wary of those people. I mean, the people that have said it to me, I, I know and trust. But if anybody comes to you and says like, ah, this is all too slow. We want real action, real shit. You can bet your ass the estate agent. <laughs> so, and I don't mean a real estate agent. <laughs> anybody that's in a real hurry for this uh you're gonna regret knowing a person like that so yeah if you yeah i mean there, there is a time to do that you you know think of it like um schneider in the book on tyranny right um what's his name tim schneider so showed you that um he's he's saying is what you can do with the oncoming tyranny is the resistance to uh, fascism, national socialism, um, and all those kind of totalitarian things, they came from just groups of people. I mean, we're talking airplane clubs and stamp collecting clubs and book clubs and, you know, reading circles and, you know, gardening. You see, the people are naturally think the same way. And then when things get really bad, then, then those groups go, is terrible to do something about it. And they, they know what to do because they've already started from that. You know, whatever they they start to realize, their lessons in their gardening or their lessons in their hobby, electrics hobby, they know what to do based on that, you see. And so so they, you know, they start from that seed. So, yeah, so, yeah, I just think... We carry on this pretty much as, as we were and just just see um, but yeah I mean I think you can feel yourself being de devoted after there, there was this other focus with the uh, with COVID but we, we're losing it now because they're saying to everybody oh it's all uh, it's, well it's over from the point of view is we just have to live with it. <laughs> we, can't, we can't do anything about the, the pandemic. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's a deficit in that for the state. You see, there's a lot of water bridge, and nobody's happy about it. Nobody's happy with the response of governments. The, you see, there's, they've paid a terrible price. Governments of the world paid a price in trust and credibility and they haven't paid down a beam of that in fact they borrowed junk by stuff they don't seem to realize how far out of whack they are with the public now so yeah there's a reckoning to come you know, the growing discontent with um wage inequality and wealth inequality just 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 these these crazy power hungry bastards like these billionaires and this uh, just all these bases of power that the people are you can hear a growing murmur around the world of discontent and so yeah in in the i, I wouldn't rush to the front of the ranks in in those times right you is you see there's a there's the, there might be a big outpouring in many places. You don't want to get involved in that because it's not very enlightened. It's not directed. And, um, you know, those people are going to pay. So it's, it's better to learn from them and learn, learn what happens to them. And so you start from a, a deep underground place. It's, it's not so good to, to say like, oh, you know, Great! Finally, the revolution's happening, and you run out to the streets wearing a black collar cloth. That's not really 
a very <laughs> well you can do it if you want but i'll tell you your short your story is going to be short so it's it's much better to have higher impact and take take longer time there's, there's this old cowboy joke that is not the the wisdom of the wisdom of age and it's essentially goes like this so like the two steers at the top of the hill and the old steer and a young bull and they look down on this huge herd of heifers down below in the valley and the young bull says come on let's like charge down there and have one of those heifers and the old bull says i've got a better idea so let's walk slowly down the hill and have the whole herd <laughs> <laughs> going against the state is rather think bigger and bring them down harder but think more and softly softly and softly softly means just gathering people that think the same way yeah so you i yeah for, again this is why i feel so out of step with with faulty because He's thinking, you know, all this rage and everything can be focused and brought into bearing in the next six months. But, you know, it's, it's, it takes a, a long time to incubate this. It's when we're not there, according to, to my read of the situation. We, but it's coming. We're the, you're going to see stagflation. You're going to see scary shit in the news. You're seeing food shortages and power outage in China, supply chain problems, an ongoing pandemic. Um, so, yeah, the, it starts to look like the 70s again, where social services start to fall down, and that's collapse happens that way. People start, you know, start to get disobeyed, and, and, um, and services start to go, everybody gets pissed off. In, in those times, it, it's amazing how much it helps people to just have a knitting circle, even, where you can just talk about how things are and tell you that's not, you know, part of the hysterical herd, just, you know, running scared. Yeah. So... Yeah, so, okay, that's that's the way I see it. I hope, uh, d does anybody have a different opinion? <laughs> no, thank you for that. I think uh, I'm also one of, well, I'm in the older age group here, and I, I, I can completely understand what you're talking about in terms of, uh, even though I feel the impatience now and again. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I, I agree with you. Um, I think we need to continue to build and prepare and prepare psychologically and prepare ourselves. And yeah, yeah, that's where we are. And we can't do anything because if things are not aligned, um, it won't it won't have any effect and it will it will be actually useless to, to start anything when it's not the right time. Going back to Sansu, you know, you have to if you want to, to strike, it has to be fast and at the right time. You just don't. Don't just hit in the dark like that. And we're, we're not there yet. Yeah, in the I Ching, this is one of the 60 changes is um, is this one, which we, we're at, uh, which is, uh, what I think, a transition or change, something like that. But Anyway, the advice there is to, to just cultivate, prepare, you know, just go to your seat, carve your weapon, do your training. <laughs> you can always work on yourself. You see. So it's um, uh, the avoid behavior is really an avoidance of, on confronting the issue and working on yourself. So, you know, working on yourself means. You know, getting wisdom in uh, on the Titanic, basically. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm on the same boat uh, as both of you. Um, if at this time it's best to prepare, uh, do some self-developing. And um, when collapse really hits hard, it's going to hit people differently wherever you are. That's what I'm learning. It's, there's no one-size-fits-all approach. So wherever you are, wherever you're based, I think um, it's good to learn the lay of the land for where you, wherever you are, too. Yeah, you see, the, that is 50% of the battle is, is flexibility. So I've said it a number of times. Actually, the thing that we were talking about this morning was was, was AI, and uh, I mentioned about psychedelics and that kind of thing. So um, I said we probably shouldn't talk about AI because it was really kind of a bad thing, but the um, that thing that we're discussing about how taking psychedelics puts you in a state of really kind of um, heightened awareness, but it's really a state of panic or psychosis or, um, uh, yeah, th th that kind of a state um, is has lots of possibilities for self-development. You can rewire your brain. It's kind of, it makes your brain more fluid, more plastic. It can, it can change more easily. So uh, I don't think that you should be taking psychedelics for a number of reasons. It's, um, it's kind of like uh, tourism. It's kind of like you don't really get to know a place. Uh, you get there by relying on a, a drug, which is not a good idea because you're dependent on getting to that state with some kind of external agency and the people and stuff where you manage to source all of that, which is probably not good company. So there are whole loads of reasons why you don't want to actually pop pills and stuff for doing that. But you want to get to a stage where you get to that stage on your own. You don't need to go and buy DMT and LSD and MDMA and psilocybin and stuff. You make all those things, uh, you know, you, you can mess with your own serotonin. So all these things are serotonin reuptake inhibitors and stuff. So you should be working on that of how to use the pharmacological chemistry set in your own brain. Um, I mean, just think about it. If the whole world does go to shit and you get to really hard, hard knocks, like say like the siege of Sarajevo and you, you turn into one of those guys, you have to live in, you know, in, in in a situation like that well it's going to be really hard to source your lsd or whatever you, you are using for your enlightenment so you you shouldn't be borrowing enlightenment that way it's kind of fake um it's kind of like saying you know i'm i'm superhuman when i have my my spinach but like it's like yeah but you're not without your spinach you're a weakling so rather concentrate on building up your muscle rather than you know telling everybody else spinach is wonderful. And so that means, you know, avoid all these things like psychedelics, but try to get to those states. So you, so one of the, the points of a cult and one of the points of a group is you can get to that state of, you know, panic or psychosis or something is actually a, a very fine state of fine energy, they would often call it, sakwa. So, um, that's that sattva is, is also peace. Actually, you ride ride it and surf the wave. You, you it really is not, you know, panic. It's panic in terms of the mechanisms of your neurophysiology, but it's not panic in terms of actually the experience. In fact, like an LSD trip, it's like it's not a, always a bad LSD trip. You you would have have an LSD trip that was people think it's fantastic it's ecstatic so yeah it's doing the, i think something like a one third of 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 trip on trips on ayahuasca or lsd acid or something are really bad trips and it, i guess it's probably the same when you're doing these these kind of exercises on your uh on your own but they they all come in in various ways, uh, waves. So it's not like one one episode or something is 
completely, oh, that was good or that was bad. It has good and bad parts. And you're kind of elevating the, the dose. So you can, you know, there's, there's a video, I think I posted it on the next one, of this guy just talking about, you know, they're, they're starting to do genuine research into psychedelics and stuff, trying to make it scientific. And he's looking at, you know, kind of categorizing. If you have 10 milligrams or 15 milligrams, you know, or what, depending on the dose, all the stuff that happens, which is a good way to go. It's basically these are, if you're a neurologist, is telling you these are the, the possible states that your brain is going through, and then you can find out reasons why. You can save yourself quite a lot of trouble by going and looking at shamanic things and Hindus and all, all these, um, these gurus. They know all this stuff already, so, so they're doing a lot of this stuff in a Western reductionist way um, that is already described by things. You know, you can say, well, what are the doses? And they, they translate to chakra and things like that. Somebody actually asked me on one of the videos, because I mentioned the thing about the octave. So the octave was, he wanted to know more about that. And I said, well, I just inherited that from my my cult and it was because it came from Gurdjieff, Gurdjieff got it from Marsilius Ficino and the, the Neoplatonists, you know, that were around the De Medici's and Michelangelo and uh, Botticelli, all those, those um, Da Vinci, all of those guys, they were in this, this kind of secret cult, right, there was a secret cult. And if you look at the Primavera and stuff, it's all codes to tell people, you know, all those guys. You can look at the letters of Marsilio Ficino, and you know that they published. But I mean, it's it's secret knowledge. But <coughs> they got all this stuff from Pythagoras, and so Pythagoras, is, you know, we think of him as oh, and discovering the secret to the octave. And but it does. It's much older, much much older than Pythagoras, and they thought much more, and not just sound. You see, where they're coming from is. They're thinking of these states, like 10 micrograms of LSD, they're thinking of as a sound vibration. They're thinking it's all vibrations of the universe. Um, so they, uh, they're they thinking of, you know, chakras and sound vibrations. And so then it was natural for Pythagoras on, the, on this kind of way of thinking that, you know, this would be a kind of vibrational level that you would feel as, you know, like 10 milligrams of LSD. And so then they would say that's the first chakra. Then there are various different states that you can uh, now, as a reductionist neurologist to studying LSD, you can go and categorize and say, well, people see these kind of illusions, they see, or they have the phenomena that is associated with each one of those, those vibrational states. So it's kind of an analogy in a way. Um, Pythagoras was certainly not right that if you play do, re, mi, or some, you know, you get a middle C that's genuine vibration at what 96 hertz or whatever. It's like it de it's definitely not that, but it's it's an analogy just saying, like, you know, you could say colors are, you know, when I'm feeling blue or purple, now I'm really angry, I'm seeing red. <clears throat> so you're using the frequencies of colors to describe moods and states of mind, and it's kind of like that. <coughs> but the you see what what people don't realize and especially in our culture is and with with personal development is people think well there's personal development because there's so many self-help gurus and people that you know, say like no you haven't quite got the right idea the, the self-development most people and life coaches and all of this they they all just in that octave model they just in the first three do re mi so they never get over me that and even I mentioned before that the me is kind of almost a joke because it's narcissistic, it's egotistical, it is all about me. And most of those self-help gurus and stuff, the, you know, the internet is groaning with all these these guys trying to give people help. But it's itself how to become me, is how to get from do, re, and me. So re is kind of, you know, timorous, tre you know, kind of trembling, you can almost hear could you know fall back to do again or do sounds kind of dumb like individual and so yeah most people can see well you might be troubled and come 
get to Ray, start to think, well, I'm changing, and then you know, resolve into say, me, now me. And they, people are doing all of these things which are narcissistic. So a lot of the thing, I think, in terms of the trans community, if, if you mention trans community, then people say, oh, you don't understand trans. Well, ah, fuck you. I understand trans better than a lot of trans people. So what they're doing is they they trying to resolve into do, re, me. And so it what they re, how they resolve it, it depends on how they can and kind of came in. So I said in one of my videos is the trajectory coming into this determines your tra trajectory coming out and the results you get. So just like Bob Marley says, <laughs> you can't you you know, you can't sow like yams and expect to reap, you know, reap corn. So, the, so, yeah, you know, people have this idea of, you know, a cultural background and then they know that they need a, some kind of change and transformation and metamorphosis. And then somebody tells them, oh, you're unhappy because you're really a woman inside. And so then guys change and try and, you know, say, try and be woman and say, no, it's not. It's there's a deeper change, a psychological change, um, and it's a very old metamorphosis that goes back to you know, tens of thousands of years to the caves where shamans did these transformations. So, just knowing that there are levels and transformations is a mind blower for people. People do you know, most people you know can go to their graves in our culture not not knowing that there are higher states of intellect, of emotion, of being. And the, the way you get to them is by rewiring your brain. So with this plasticity. So in other words, you go through these psychotic states, these plasticity, that can be mimicked with LSD, but you don't want to use it. Now, they're perverting all of this, all this research now that they're doing into psychedelics. They're immediately perverting it into, oh, it helps people you know, stop smoking and there might be clinical benefits and it's always this fucking acquisitive, rapacious mining that everybody wants to do. It's it's always how do I acquire, acquire, acquire? So the first thing is to stop this acquisitive attitude. So everybody going to you know, self help. I want to be a better person. Okay, first step one is fuck that idea. Fuck the idea that there is a better person, that higher states are more desirable. You can you can go through your entire life as an ox or an ape. It doesn't matter. The universe doesn't require you to be enlightened. It's, it, there's, there's no, there are no prizes here, okay? Yeah, so it's like, be an idiot. You, you're allowed to be a fucking idiot your whole life and die. That's the choice of millions, billions, in fact. Just so... You only do it if you if you have a need. <laughs> you, if you're compelled not to do that, then yeah, then you you make the journey. But it's like it's like you don't really have to go from A to B. A and B are exactly the same. So don't you know this idea of I need to acquire a higher consciousness. I need to be perfect. It's like, look, Basel, you're a chimp. You're a fucking glorified chimp. In fact. You're a chimp with 150 genes knocked out. Chimps have a lot more going for them than we do. Okay. So we're kind of a, a knockdown version of a chimp. Okay. So tell me what a perfect chimp is. What's a perfect chimp? It's like, I don't know what a perfect chimp is. It's like, if you point out and go to the zoo, tell me, oh, that one, Coco, that's a perfect chimp there. That's a class A perfect chimp there. So why? That chimp has a halo? It's <laughs> like, what the fuck are you talking about? No such thing as a perfect chimp. What would it even mean to be perfect if, as a human being? It's like, ah, oh, you never sin. It's like, what does that even mean? It's like, you, just just being good to one person could mean you, you're depriving somebody else. It means you can't get into a zero-sum game. You know, as soon as you go down to the shops and buy something, you've engaged in a zero-sum game and you fucked somebody over. So it's like, it's the thought that, oh, well, Jesus is perfect. Why? He's a fucking idiot. He goes down the, you know, the mustard tree. He dams a mustard tree. The tree's in the, out of season. He dams it for not bringing fruit. Why would you expect the tree to have fruit in the off season? And why would you make it wither? 
just because it's, it's like psychotic. It's like Jesus is not perfect. Get over it. But it's like, get over all these ideas. There's perfection. There's a, enlightenment. There's, uh, you know, some something you have to be other than you are. Uh, that you have to acquire stuff. It's like, it's like these are the source of all our misery. And so the best you know, step forward you can make is like shedding all of those rather than gaining more delusions. <laughs> anyway, I just I just snuck that in there because somebody asked about the, the octave, but I can go into it in hell a lot more detail if you want. We can go over the primavera <laughs> if you really want to get punished. <laughs> but you see, I think that this is a good way to spend the time on the Titanic. You see, I if you take the analogy of the Titanic, and it's a really good one, um, we're not in, in the, oh, you know, before we hit the iceberg. Look, guys, we hit the iceberg. <laughs> we hit the iceberg. We're at the point where the Titanic is going to sink. The guys on the bridge have already done the maths. They've worked out how quickly these compartments fill up, and they worked out, oops, this baby's going down. So if, if the guys in the you know, the, and then all the leadership posts and the power positions, if you're struggling to work out why they're behaving like they are, it's like they know something you don't, and that is they know this ship is going down. So that's the first thing. So once you're there, then, you know, it's like how do you behave on the fucking Titanic? Well, it's kind of miserable at first because you wander around looking in all the cabins and you go, well, in Jim Bell, ben De ben Dell's cabin, they're all like, lighting candles and preparing phenobarbital and you think, oh, ooh, I don't think I'm going to go in this group. It's a little bit creepy, all singing Kumbaya and everything. It's like, ah, I'll miss that cabin. You go into like Faulty's cabin. He's like, well, we're going to insulate this cabin. It's going to be waterproof. So we'll be fine. Like, really? You're going to insulate a cabin on the Titanic and you think you're going to be fine? I don't think you're going to make that cabin waterproof. And even if you did, how does that stop you when the Titanic goes down? It's, you're, you're you're probably in a worse situation because you're you you know you, you prolong the suffering by being in a waterproof cabin. So you go to each one of these, you go to some some different cabin. These these guys are hedonists. They're going to party till they drop. And it's like each one of these things. You go like pick your cabin. Is who, how do you want to go down on the Titanic? Well, I tell you from my personal preference, I'd rather find the you know, the wise people that are going over the stories of uh, putting it all together, sense-making guys. Then, you know, sense-making is the big phrase now. So it's guys sitting, doing kind of what we're doing and saying, in the end times, you have a requiem, you know, have a memorial. And that means, um, you know, understanding what happened, what happened, what happened to the civilization, what happened to this hominid that uh, ran rampant all over the planet, killed it, and now it's going to go extinct. Is that it's like, you know, adding meaning to that story. It takes people telling stories. It takes people discussing it. It takes people dredging up stuff, having insights from the past, a little bit of grief, a little bit of joy, a little bit of fun. But that's the way you want to go down on the Titanic. All these other people are, are kind of green. They're kind of unripe. Um, and they'll never get to a point where you want to get to a point where the Titanic goes down and you, you're you okay with it. <laughs> because, you know, it's kind of like a, a day well, well spent, the end of the show. But, so that's, that's my philosophy. And so you have to forgive all these people that aren't, you know, what I consider personally pretty bad movies. They're pretty, pretty bad, bad movies to get into. So in other words, we, we're all on the Titanic, but you, you get the chance to make your own ending. Right? It's in one of those computer games where you make your own ending. And even if we're totally wrong and, you know, the aliens come down and save us or I'm completely fucked up about AI and it solves all our problems and makes abundance and so boy, was Hugh ever fucking wrong? And then uh, 
even if that happens, you're still really in the same position because, you know, we all individuals and you all have to face your death we're not going to become immortal immortal even if you go into the transhuman sub on reddit and see all those crazy fucks um they, they're not going to become immortal they're just a very very sad sick bunch and so you see a guy there i saw a guy with 19 and he says am i born too early uh will i just miss the cutoff for immortality <laughs> it's like Oh, you poor dumb fuck. It's like this guy really thinks we're going to achieve immortality by 2100 or something, and he's just going to be too old. You know, it'd be like, oh, I'm old or I die. And it's like, wow, if I could only have been bored 10 years later, I would have achieved immortality. But there goes the ship without me. Damn, born in the wrong, born in the wrong year. It's like, oh, you poor sad fuck. Yeah, you know, the next 10 years, the next 20 years, that poor bastard, 19 years old, that's his understanding, that we, we're off to the stars. <laughs> it's like, oh, you poor dumb fuck. Wait till you realize we're on the Titanic and stuff. And you see, all of these guys, are, just imagine what's the movie they're going to go through. They go in this movie saying, this is a wonderful world we live in. This is the apex of AI, and soon all the problems will be solved. And we'll be off to, you know, we'll have the singularity of the nerds and we'll have immortality and finally achieve all mankind's dreams. You go from that to, what, what do you mean, like, starving? There's nothing on the shelves. It's like, you know, what, what they're power cats? It's like, <laughs> it's like uh, at some stage, this guy's going to figure, um, maybe we don't get to 2100 with, um, you know, AI sort of. <laughs> so it's like... Oh, you poor dumb fuck. But anyway, you have a look at there. There are like 50 million people, literally 50 million people on the, the transhuman things like Elon Musk's site and stuff. And I, I post one thing, you know, dissing Elon Musk, and then like instant lifetime ban. But you see, it's all cults. So uh, they all, you know, each one of these cabins on the Titanic is a cult. So it's kind of like, we're in the end times. What happens? Well, pick your cult. <laughs> so, so what we're really doing is just, you know, making a cult that people would like to be in, rather than some nightmare one that no, no one would like to be in. You see, you see, if you, if you just said it like that, if you said, guys, this is the end of the show. This is Act Three, in a, in a very amazing play. So you're saying like. Yeah, the great part is you don't get to change the world or make a different ending. But within the plot <laughs> that has been written for you, you get to choose any part you want, and you you have a lot of uh, discretion to to you know go down. It's a very big play with a lot of different things going on. So you 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 know it's kind of like rooms in in the Titanic, cabins in the Titanic. So you get to pick. You know how you're going to play this. You get to pick which cabin you go in. It's like you do have a lot of options, right? But you don't have an option to say, "Well, I'll make sure the Titanic isn't going to go down." It's like I uh, you don't have that, <laughs> that option. Now you can easily find a cabin where people are like, "Right, guys." In fact, you'll find whole decks of people going like, "Right, what we got to do is." We've got to stop, and we know what it is. The scientists have told us that there's a big leak in the Titanic, so we have to go and plug the leak and stuff, and you're saying, like, well, I don't want to spend time with these idiots. Time with idiocy is like, you know, any fool would take two minutes to say, like, guys, stop. Think about it. There's icy water streaming in here. Look at the, look at the captain and the guys on the wheelhouse. <laughs> You just look at their body language and their posture and their actions and what they're saying. You know we're fucked. <laughs> okay, so forget how we're going to rally and change the situation. It's like that ain't going to happen. So start. So say like start thinking. How do you want this movie to end? What cabin do you want to be in? How are you going to play it from here? Now you know it, just that is doing people a lot of favor. It, you're doing people a tremendous favor just laying out the truth of our situation, right? Because, you know, can you imagine how pissed off these people are? You see, these people are always a day late and a dollar short. So, so Fawlty is in this position. 
he's, he's going to be like, you know, where does this end up? You realize, oh, six months goes past. No, there wasn't a revolution. No, these people are still, you know, no, it wasn't Selma. No, it's a, and even if you, you made it somewhere, you know, you know, this is going to be a very fucked up movie. There's, you know, it's written all over it. It's, you know, the police crimes bill is coming. It's, you know, <laughs> where this ends up, right? So it's like, do you want to be in this movie? Is that your ending movie? You join XR, you join, you know, this, and you you try and change the world and make the government change and go, you know, head to head with the public. And you see, uh, is, is that how you want to spend this? Like, is, I mean, it's your option. Maybe that's your, that's your thing. You want to die a martyr or something like that? Go for it. <laughs> Go for it. It's, it's all personal preference, right? There yeah, is no there, right. There is a parallel in what you're saying about our place on the Titanic and what you were saying earlier about self-development and trying to attain some kind of something that you're not. You know, I think there is there is parallel in the in the two in the two paths. And uh, and uh, yeah, well, that's that's what I was thinking. I, I can I can actually see that very clearly. Um, with people who are trying to do this, you know, trying to to yes to attain another, uh, <laughs> to follow another another internet uh, person who's going to tell them, you know, it's the same it's the same intellectual and the same psychological path I think that you're talking about. Yeah, the see the the thing that costs people a lot of time is is denial of the the situation so they but if if they didn't deny the situation they didn't waste all this time and they were honest about it and brave and faced it then they would they have the option to go and look at what other people have done so it's like this planet has been really populated and populated by a lot of smart people so it's you know you're not the first one to be faced with this you're kind of like the hundredth billionth person to be faced with these things but everybody takes them like this is the very first time anybody said it was like no it isn't and if you go and have a look then it you know once you admit the situation then you can go and have a look at other people and when you have a look at how other people tell that you find that all your assumptions are about you know how this all pans out are wrong and you can find that a lot of people will, will tell you that, you know, the, their best time, the best time of their life is in hospice. So you go, you don't have long in hospice, but you have the best quality of time in life. And so my way of thinking is that, you know, you want to be on those kind of tracks. So say the best quality of life. So so it, it, it grieved me a lot when people kind of distracted doing stuff and, uh, the the thing that really makes my heart ache is people just doing busy shit. It's they they're doing weird busy shit that's like thinking that it's stuff you know I have to do, and um, you know it's uh, it'll pay off in the end or some some something or just mind it's it, that mindless activity so mindless protest, mindless consumption, mindless uh, hedonism. Uh, you know, all of these things is is like to me it's hell on wheels. To me, I think, you, and again, this is personal, but I say you have to add mindfulness. You have to add observation. See yourself, otherwise, you 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 know the clock will run out on you, the bell will toll, and you'll be like, oh shit, is that the time? Shit, I just realized I just said something straight out of. A parable of <laughs> the New Testament, but it's it's uh, Jesus' parable of the the widows. It's, it's you see it's again I I'm glad I said that because I'm just showing to you that there's nothing new under the sun. Right? There's nothing new under the sun. You can go and find all of it in in the New Testament. <laughs> yeah, what you're saying there, you've all seen that movie V for Vendetta, right? 
there's that part where she's locked in the cell and she finds that note, you know, written by that, you know, lesbian lady. And part of the note said that, you know, that while she was living with her girlfriend, that she had roses and she never apologized to anyone. And that really resonated with me. It's like, you know, you want to do that because she was conscious of her situation. And then she ended up in that concentration camp and died. But she had no regrets because, you know, she got to do exactly what she wanted with her life and none of that distraction bullshit or doing what her parents said and all that, you know? Yeah, the, the thief of time is thinking you have more than you have. So, you know, that's why everybody's doing a great disservice to other people with all these lies and diversions and stuff in them, you know, divergent behavior, uh, avoidance behavior and stuff is, is we all lying to each other that we have more time than we do. So the scientists are, you know, the scientists are criminals. The scientists are cowardly, fucked up criminals. The politicians are, are no, they're worse. They're psychopaths, and so they. But what the the real crime that they're doing is, uh, by by telling people that we have more time than we do, they're not living their best life. So they're stealing their best life from them, and then the billionaires and stuff they're doing it deliberately. They think we're all cattle, and they think we're stupid fucks. And if you act and behave like a stupid fuck. You can't complain when they treat you like a stupid fuck. So if you if you bleat, if you behave like a sheep, like we're gonna shear you, dude. It's like it's wolves and sheep. <laughs> We're wolves. So you behave like a sheep, we'll take your wool. Gladly. And so all the billionaires are taking our wool, they're taking our time. They, and then you know, they're lying to us, saying you know, it's gonna work hard, work hard. And so uh, you work hard and you're smart. You can also have uh, 300 billion like me. <laughs> and then they laugh under their hand. <laughs> but you see, all of these guys, it's all macchio, macchio, macchio. This, you see, uh, a lot of these guys like Gurdjieff uh, and said also like Pilgrim's Progress. There's a, a guys that have this narrative of self-improvement or self-progression or this path to enlightenment kind of thing. Um, then, uh, and even the ancient Egyptians, and you get echoes of this in, excuse the pun, you get echoes of this in the caves, in the ancient caves, <laughs> Shobi Cave, and um, you know, when they're doing an obvious shamanic ritual, which is probably a rebirth ritual. And, and you see, what what they they have over and over again is they tell you that all these these uh, impediments along the way. There are all these people that try and trick you, divert you, waylay you, um, all a million tricks along the road path to enlightenment. So in Zen, they just call them makyo, the devil's cave. You get lured into this devil's cave. What, what each one of these things is, is the time wasting. So that is just again and again and again. It's different ways of stopping you on the journey. And they, they're all various forms of costing you time. So, costing you time and energy, you know. So, you know, but you know, robbers and thieves and crooks <laughs> and they're good companions, but not that many. So the they, uh, but uh, at the at the end of the day, you you cannot rely on anybody. You have to be your own guru on that. Path. If you take that path seriously, as well, if you if you like that narrative and you like that story, that you're on a path to enlightenment, which is, I'll tell you right now, spoiler alert: if you're on that path, when you get to enlightenment, you'll realize you either were already enlightened or there was no such thing as enlightenment. But anyway, you have to go through this journey to discover that, and so I highly recommend you do. But even if I told you the result, and it's not disappointing. It's good to know. <laughs> but um, yeah, that idea of um, uh, uh, having these these agents of uh, helpers, you know, paracletes and things like that, and ha having these demons that uh, delay you, mostly demons, most mostly on malevolent, you know, kind of like trolls of the bridge. 
answer these questions. Three, what is your favorite color? <laughs> it's like, they, you know, everybody thinks, well, I have to answer correctly with the favorite color. And so like, no, the guy's just trying to waste your time. See, it's like, it's like, I will give you the answers to the universe, study physics. And it's like, I will tell you the secrets of the atom. And then, you know, it's like you go and do advanced physics. You spend seven years and you're like $200,000 in the hole. And you say, there you are. You know everything about it. It's like, I know fuck all. I know fuck all about the universe. And I'm 200000 down and seven years of my prime years wasted in a fucking university. You say like, aha, but you didn't make any progress. Ha <laughs> ha. Goodbye. <laughs> They're all these kind of demons trying to waste your time, waste your time. All these hooks you, you get, you know, people that exploit you, like rich people. Everybody goes like, oh, I could become rich and stuff. And then they they attracted to rich people. Rich people have, are, are professional fishermen and fisherwomen. So, so they will lure you in thinking, oh, some of their magic will fall onto you. No, they tight as a duck's ass. They're going to suck the life out of you. They're vampires. So they're all these characters along the road, vampires and, you know, and then these religious people that tell you all this nice stuff. And, and then there's the guys who give you drugs and the bliss merchants and gurus that make you feel good and stuff. And you, you can spend years and years and years. And then it's like, whoa, that's expensive progress because you you didn't make very you didn't go very far on the journey. You wasted a lot of time and money, a lot of time, energy, and money. And so, yeah. So what I'm saying is, a you first know that that's the story. <laughs> it, see, you can't blame anybody. They don't know the story. They didn't even know this was what it was all about. They fed some bullshit on the very first demon that they arrived. The very first demon that gets you is somebody early in your childhood, probably a school teacher who fills your head with rocks. But basically, it's, it's something school teachers and these, all those, you know, especially kindergarten teachers, they might think that they're all the salt of the earth and they're helping the children and stuff. And yeah, but they, what they're really doing, and they might get to, to see it if they if they really astute. But they're doing what we used to do when we were kids, and we used to have to go on these hikes. We have to spend a, a, a week at the end of every year going on these hikes and camping and stuff in the mountains. And there was a favorite trick we'd do is basically put rocks in other people's backpack. <laughs> so, it's a good thing to do because it keeps you on your toes. It's a way of elevating your attention. But you know, it's basically a, it'd be you can, it's a, it's an art because you can't put too many rocks in because the guy will figure out that he's somebody's put rocks in his pack, and so then he'll he'll take them out and find out who did it. But if you get it really right, <laughs> you, you, he doesn't know that you put rocks in it. <laughs> he just has a difficult time. So we used to do all that kind of thing, and that's kind of what happens, you know, with psychological de development. There are all these people that put rocks in your backpack, uh, and one of the first is your kindergarten teacher. She'll definitely put a big boulder or two in your backpack. <laughs> and you, so you have to. Nobody tells you. No, you've got to stop and unload those fucking boulders. And so stopping and unloading those boulders is, you know, don't do it on an acid trip. You, you need to go on an acid trip, but one you create in your own head, right? You need to get rid of the boulders. So that another way of describing it, these, these are obstacles. So these are nexuses or neuroses or what complexes in Freud's things, but we've got all these complexes and, um, and that's, the makyo, that, that is really the demons that waylay you. It's not always people that you meet on the road of life. They're internal. Well, see, what the people on the road of life do is they're stuck in an idea in your head. And it's kind of like, say, here, have a rock. <laughs> and you go, oh, thank you. Ah, uh, I really value this person, so I'm going to cherish this rock. And I'll stick it in the backpack. <laughs> and you're like, oh, no. Oh, you know what you're saying there? Reminds me of a part in Moby Dick where he talks about how 
um, Ahab thought that putting like um, the head of these two whales on um, his ship would balance it better or whatever. And then Ishmael in the book talked about how balancing the two heads of like a lock and then Hobbs or whatever on the ship makes it hard for it to go over the sea. And, you know, the sea is a metaphor for like the universe and consciousness and stuff. And so it's really good. So like Ishmael said, yeah, the, it burdens the ship down and makes it not sail very good. <laughs> Yeah, but you see, the, the important thing there is that they're whales' heads, right? So that they think that everybody, you see, like, if you look at physics, physics is in a crisis. So, you know, it's in a crisis because people argue that if it's in a crisis or not, but it's in a crisis because they got as far as they can go. They kind of, as we're talking about AI, they're searching this, this problem space of what is the universe, and they've got to local minima. You know, premature optimization. So small peak, where obviously they're on they're at the end of this peak, and now they can see, oh fuck, we climbed the wrong mountain. There's Everest is still somewhere off, and we don't know how to get to Everest. So it was physics today, just as we get to the end of all these institutions, they're probably closing down in the next ten years or so because they would be unfundable when the world starts collapsing. So we kind of got to the end of physics, and it's a very like meh. Thing. But the reason why we got to this local optima and not to a bigger one like Everest is because of all these whales. You get, you know, all these guys like Einstein and, and Darwin and Feynman and Murray Gell-Mann and Ed Witten and uh, Dirac and, you know, all these big names, these big whales. Um, that's uh, then people. Uh, you know, idolize, and they become obstacles to any further progress. So they give the illusion of progress. Like Einstein will say, "Ah, oh, you know, gravity is not a force; it's curved space-time." Well, it's like, "Oh, really?" So when I put a weight on a spring, I can see that spring is under a bit of force. So fuck off, Einstein. <laughs> but anyway, you can't say that because Einstein's a genius. What are you better than Einstein? And so these whales, uh, uh, basically. Weigh us down. So, so, you know, Hobbes and Locke are classics of what weighed us down. They're Enlightenment thinkers and they weighed us down with this idea of, of, of progress. So that's Machio say, take this path. This is a shortcut. And you're like, oh, when you take that path, you find you in the brambles. So, you, you know, that, that's where we've been. Science, physics has gone into the brambles after making such fabulous progress when they, you know, Baconian method and empiricism goes and winds up, you know, bogged down in this quagmire of um, of where we are today. String theory is just quagmire, and so you know, nothing really fits or works and stuff. And so, uh, and that, like you say, it's it was large part of the problem is these big whales that uh, weigh us down, and and getting past them is a uh, ditching them, psychologically saying, you know, diminish them, stop yeah. worshipping all these stupid people. Yeah, you got to cut them loose. And then, uh, get, yeah, and then uh, work, work shit out for yourself. There you go, be a guru. Then. But in, you see, a lot of, you see, what's going on is, uh, okay, if you say, if you take this uh, kind of uh, enlightenment or epiphany, the psychotic experience that you can build up to by, you know, messing with your own dopamine levels and DMT and stuff like that. Your internal own neurotransmitters, not scoreboard. See, uh, building up, well, the way you that up, I mentioned that, you know, a cult and stuff gives you fine energy or sakwa. Another way of saying it is is this, is it means that you, you don't have impediments uh, to almost having an epileptic fit. So you, the model is the current model for an epileptic fit, I think is still current, but it's basically that you overload your brain, that there's too much electricity, there's everything's too wired up. And so there's not enough inhibition on, you know, it's like everything is lit up instead of just salient parts. And so then, you know, that, that's not a bad analogy, I don't think. But you say you, that is a desirable state. It, 
now we consider it a pathology and people don't like that, you know, that, that, that because you're a slave and epilepsy then stops you being a good slave. So, but it used to be called a divine disease and, and you know, people like the halo and the, the early parts coming on to the grand mal seizure where they pass out. So, so what's, what's happening and getting, so, so I'm, I'm saying is you, you want to get to that. You want to have an epileptic fit. You don't want to stay, this, this little chimp that you are now is, is suboptimal. So I'm saying you, you do want to get to this you psychotic or epileptic state. But uh, see, how you get there is by slowly, you know, working through these domains. It's kind of like an Ising spin model. So it's, you have all these domains of thought and they don't agree with each other. And that's it. It's protection in it because you don't have an epileptic fit and you're a good slave. But it makes you incredibly stupid because you, you're going from like one domain to, to another. And in those domains, you're completely oblivious to the other domains. And they very often, they're contradictory. So it, it stops the flow of, say, electricity in your brain, which you can say is either good or bad, depending on whether you, you like the status quo or you want change. But the secret to change is uh, is finding all these domains, seeing them, and reconciling them, so that you don't want to have these <clears throat> ideas and oppositions, all these contradictions in your head. But people people do. The, the average person has all these compartmentalized ideas. Often they conflict. Somebody else can see that they conflict, but they don't see it because when they're in this domain, they're always in this domain, and when they're in this domain, they don't realize, hey, that's, I still remember that domain. Uh, this contradicts it. So, for example, I, I gave this example, which is one of the best ones I can think of because I, you can see it cross-culturally. I've mentioned this before. But I went to India in, like, 2007, and I got kind of tricked into going into this missionary thing. This woman said she wanted me to deliver something to them, so I took it. But... Obviously, she really wanted me to go and see her, the big love of her life, which is this Christian mission. So anyway, I, it was a very, very interesting experience. And I went to this Christian mission. But I told you before, I was having this conversation by, with all these women. They're complete apocalyptic doomers. And so we're having tea, and they're having this, you know, this uh, conversation saying, yeah, this is definitely the end times. You can see the apocalypse coming. The rapture's coming, and they all agree, you know, there are like 12 of them, and they're like, yeah, 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 you can see this is the end times. It has everything, just like it says in the Bible. Yeah, but we're prepared. We're ready for the rapture. We're ready to see Jesus and stuff like that. So I said, how long is going to tell? Oh, we're in like three years. We, 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 we're on the short haul, you could see, and they all nod shades. And then the conversation goes on, and not five minutes later, then we get on to geopolitics and we start talking about India. Now, if you've been to India, you'll find that most Indians are very, very patriotic. <laughs> so they, anything about India, war, the huge pride. So they start talking about brand India and they're getting more and more into how fantastic India is and how India is going to take over the world. And then, and then they, they're daring me, you know, because they, they assume I'm American. So then they daringly say, you know, oh, you know, we're you know, kind of cheeky, you know, we're going to overtake America, you know, just, you know, stepping back to see my reaction. And I, I said to them, like, well, how long? And they say, oh, you know, like by 2050 or so. And I said, you don't think the rapture is going to, like, screw that up, do you? And it was, like, it was just like, <laughs> this is ashen faces because they were like, They'd ne Although they'd obviously had the brand India and how India is going to take over the world conversation a lot, they were used to that. That lived in the little domain here in their thinking. And then their Christian part, which they believed equally strongly, lived in a little, had a little home here in their thinking. And they'd also obviously discussed that. You could see they all had consensus on that. But they'd never noticed that 
the rapture is coming imminently and oh india by 2100 oh we're going to be <laughs> and so so you think well oh it's just incidental that you know what does it matter well what it matters is that they the the wires basically they have uh, obstacles to this free flow of electricity in their brain so if you take this idea and you, you you point out a guru would point out this conflict and what you know freud would say it's a neurosis i'm taking a very simple thing which is just an idea like brand india and Chris, christian rapture but freud would tell you you know there's different um complexes that you have that have got you know strong emotional content and all these different reasons and stuff but anyway you get the general ideas that you've got these domains that are need reconciliation and if you reconcile them you bridge them then you have this free flow of electricity so if you could say like okay pick one brand india or the rapture and you know but in doing that you you have almost like a hegelian dialectic in resolving brand india and the rapture you would say okay both of them are bullshit but you know from the synthesis and antithesis you or rather this thesis and antithesis then you'd get a synthesis and so you know hegel said you know you keep on getting better and better synthesis as well not really you keep on removing all these obstructions so you get more free flow of ideas and thoughts and and you flip up. it's kind of like log jams in this river system so now you know we we don't observe it we don't have a culture of pointing this out to people so then you get the behavior like say insulate britain it's like we just admitted that we all fuck with doomers we just as big a doomers as we are but then you forget all that suddenly you're in the part that's like but here's the good news we're gonna you know glue our faces to the road and, and you, what but this makes no sense with you so but there's some deliberate denial and protection people are protecting this map that they've made they don't want to throw out the map and they're very scared you know the cop i mentioned in the ai thing this morning about the cop the cop there is standing at the junction part of it is stopping too much free flow of electricity or information or insight or consciousness so it's kind of damping down inhibiting all these these zones so the that internal cop it's actually located in a specific module in our brain the anterior singular gyrus i think it is but it's it's well known in neuro neurology that the connectome you know, comes to this big junction and that big junction then has a kind of traffic cop that really really dampens the 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 movement of uh, electricity around the brain um the the cons consequences is that you get a salience landscape and you're kind of socialized and you don't see tigers in the store and stuff which you'll know when you see that video from this morning but the uh the downside is you don't get to this enlightenment where all the circuits are open and you get a complete free flow. You, you don't have to have it all the time, otherwise you'd be a kind of gibbering wreck. But you need at least once in your life to, to just see it. <laughs> so then if you do have that experience, that would be the realest thing in your entire life. Everything from then on would be referenced from that point of that... Uh, Kind of kernel of realization. I hope that's useful. I just chucked that in because somebody asked about the octave and stuff. Thank you. But anyway, in terms of, in terms of what to do, there's a hell of a lot of work on yourself. <laughs> you see, uh, there's a lot of potential for macchio outside and. In the big world but you can't be too solipsistic and just work on yourself you you, you, know, you ought to get involved with the rest of the world because you see ultimately you, you challenge it you're channeling the consciousness of the universe so 
if you get stuck in your own head, that doesn't work either. <laughs> Is this helping anybody? <laughs> yes. Now, what do we do about uh, fighting totalitarianism? Haha, <laughs> big question. It, so all totalitarianism does is it makes a very tough situation. So it just means Oncoming totalitarian means just you're just failing the exam and you're being downgraded. So for example, it's like going to be sent to prison. There's most most people we're all in prison now. Right. So you're saying, well, what happens when prison comes? Well, it's we're already in prison. So all that happens as things get more totalitarian is <clears throat> you get, you know, more and more into prison. So if if you got, uh, you know, for most people, if they got sent down and sent to prison now, it's just like the normal world. It's just tougher. It's just kind of a shittier version of the bigger office world. But the, the American corp space is no different from a prison. They just kind of, you know, it's kind of like, uh, it's just a harsher version of the same thing. So we are, so totalitarian, totalitarianism coming it's it, it's been here since Gebekli Tepe it's totalitarianism has overrun the entire world and it really got going with enclosure of the land and industrialism so the privatization of the land and stuff meant you know it was kind of like an open prison before then <laughs> but after the industrial revolution it was kind of like you really heard the gates clang behind you so we're in the panopticon since 1750. Right? We're just hoovering up the last you know, missionaries and governments and uh, all, all these conservationists and that. They're hoovering up the last free people, all the indigenous people and stuff. But you know, the, it's been a totalitarian prison now since about 1750. So it, because we haven't liberated ourselves, from this environment, it just gets harsher and harsher. But it's the same thing. It's it's like, um, you know, it, it, does that make any sense? Because it's it's like um, it's like these guys, like the great train robbers, the great train robbers, and uh, they, um, what was that guy's name uh, in Brazil? Um, I can't remember. Um, but anyway, the great train robbers in, in Britain was uh, after the war and um, they came down on them exceptionally hard. Um, they all got 30 year sentences and stuff like that. And they asked the guys, you know, well, do you know, the, the press and the public, they wanted to know that they were really, really sorry for what they did because they were folk heroes at a shitty time. They went and made a grab for big riches and got away with it. So they, they bucked the system. And everybody wanted to know, okay, now you're sorry you tried to make an escape, aren't you? Because they want to be justified in the incarceration. Right? The fact that they don't make any lunge for an escape means that they want to hear that their decision to comply with the prison system in Britain, I mean, the whole social system in Britain in the 1950s was just a big prison. Britain today is just a big prison island. But the... the so, but it was it was obvious to those guys in the, in that time. So the the press and everybody asked these great train robbers after they prosecuted, and said, "Are you sorry for what you did?" Desperately want to hear, "Yes, yes." It's don't try and escape. Just knuckle down and comply. That's what everybody wanted to hear. And what they did, what they said was, "No, we would do it again tomorrow, even though we've got thirty years." And they were like, "How? Why?" Yes, they're like. Because we got 30 years in a prison, they said, like, we're working class people, man. So, like, we'd have to go and work in a factory or a mine. And that's exactly what you have to do in a prison. It's just slightly harsher version, but not that much harsher than working in a factory or a mine. So, you know, it's a, so you can, you, can, you can go to college or something like that. But college is also a version of a prison system. It's just slightly relaxed. So... Totalitarian is not coming. It's it's here. It's just 
as as things get shittier, more and more people realize they what what COVID did, the reason why in the beginning we did most of the media stood, you know, comrades liberal. The mission that comrades gives you the start of liberation is to first realize you're in a prison. So everybody says like, oh, look how totalitarian the system got with this pandemic. They say, no, it was always like that. It's just now you see it because they had to show their hand. See, it's, it's so, so as things get better, as, as things get worse rather, so, you know, as the shortages of water and food and power and all of these things is, you know, then it will become more and more obvious that you're in prison. And everybody will think, well, this is turning into a prison. No, it's revealing itself as a prison. But it always was a prison. And so yeah, part, of, uh, part, part of resistance is, is understanding uh, how you, first, understanding you're a slave, and then understanding the modes of liberation for a slave. But over and over again, they'll say, revolutionary is still yeah, over and over again, you have to free yourself from mental slavery. The cop in your head, you know, they talk about it in the 60s. So then we all forget, we all forget. Maggie Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, the, the huge dessert they did to reason anarchy is they made everybody comfortable. They started handing out cigars and booze in the prison. And everybody said, we're not prisoners, we're free. <laughs> it's like, no, you dumb shit. Don't take the turkey. <laughs> Don't accept the gifts from the jailers. Because they're saying, like, we're not in prison, we've got TV. <laughs> it's like, no, that's what they do to you. They will take that TV away soon. So Maggie Thatcher Ronald Reagan gave us prosperity. <laughs> what what's prosperity? It means people forget that they know. now they slowly, you know, everything's getting shitty, and now they're starting to realize. Now we but unfortunately we've got to relearn all the stuff that they knew well in the 60s. So you're seeing all these kids today following the exact same path, coming up almost with the same slogans, and then thinking, well, this is the first time we've we're the first. We're liberals, we, we have a, an identity, and it's all about us and our feelings, and so we're the very, very first people to face this. It's like, no. Yeah, you it's know, that's the latest the, dip in a very long chain. That's one of the painful things. I heard this saying once, it's pretty funny. Um, this guy said that, like, um, those who know history are doomed to watch other idiots repeat it <laughs> that don't know history. <laughs> Well, well, I, I, I'm, I have in front of me uh, uh, the discourse of voluntary servitude by Etienne de la Boétie, which is uh, uh, was written in the 16th uh, end of 16th century, uh, and uh, we had to study it in school actually because it was uh, one of those things in France on the on the curriculum. And I mean, this, this, yeah, this was 400, four, five hundred years ago, and it's saying exactly what we're saying <laughs> about the prison. It's it's exactly the same uh, the same thing. I, I hope everybody has has read that because it's only nineteen pages, and it just says it all. And it also talks about liberation. He doesn't really say it, but it's it's that you know. But yeah. So the 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 really dangerous thing about totalitarianism is is and keep on over and over again. But this cannot be said enough. Is is how bad does this get? Well, it get bad. The Pope, yeah, the big cleaner. The, the final act of these fucking is they burn the house to the ground in spite. That's the see, the guys that match than not than be anything other than the head of the plantation. Once you've become a pharaoh, you cannot imagine being anything else than a pharaoh. All these guys 
they would rather die than lose the position. And since they don't want to lose the position, their final act of, of shitty, despicable spite is to take up all down with them. So that's what the, the whole you, point of totalitarianism is. You is were not, cutting... not to avoid it or not to, not to liberate it, it's to avoid that in that end thing. Hugh, you're cutting out. Thank you so much, but uh, I couldn't hear the last four or five sentences. Would you be able to repeat them? Yeah, the, the major thing is to avoid that last final thing. Burn the entire concentration camp plantation prison planet down to the ground. Uh, the power brokers in on this planet know that the jig is up for them. Do not release it. Right? They they will not release it. Never happens. Right? Do not you know it's betray you, sorry we we're complete shits and anyway, go free. Never we can't hear you. We can't hear you. It's you're you're cutting off all the time. There's something with the transmission. Yeah. Can you start saying the subject? Can you? Yeah. All right, damn it, I can hear you very well. <laughs> Your your uh, oh, your please. signal is in the red and it's cutting you out a lot. Okay, let me let me. Uh, okay, so yeah, when uh, I get this, uh, when you start talking about the subject, <laughs> you start getting communication broken. <laughs> yeah, the the digital principle is kicking in again. <laughs> no. it wants to keep Pharaoh on probably... the throne. Exactly. This 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 is Moloch. So final who the Pharaoh is, and the, you, I can say the power brokers on this planet, but it's our alien cortex, right? So uh, what the real danger is that that when the alien cortex knows that the jig's up, it does not say, release us to say you beyond the promised land. It says. If I don't get to the promised land, fuck you. You're not getting there either. And it's just done. So, yeah, it's it's the, 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 the reason is it's a farming mentality. So you can see it now, um, even in the UK, is they've overproduced pigs. So the government is saying, you know, uh, yeah, you're, they're too many. They, they never say, oh, you know, let them go. <laughs> the little piggies be, they tell them, you know, call them. And uh, we're, we're domestic animals to these rich folks. Did you hear that? Or Yeah, I heard that. Um, yeah. Did anyone else? Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's like uh, it's like you said in um, your uh, manumission extinction video. Like Hitler ordered the starvation of Germany when he was about to get toppled. Yeah, and out of spite, out of spite, he said that you know, you know, because he had this Darwinian kind of view, and he said, you know, the the people cannot prevail, then. On the Darwinian principle, they deserve to to die, um, and so you know, I make it so. He passed orders to destroy Germany and kill the German people en masse. So it, the orders weren't carried out, but you see that that's that's when you have to rebel is when they start doing those. But you know, um, it's you're going to need to. 
be really on your toes as an individual and as a society and stuff to make sure that a few of us get through this. But in, in terms of the threat, it's monumentally bigger than most people realize. Most people will think, the government is there to serve the people and we just need to raise awareness about climate change and they're like come on guys just i just posted the thing about 9 11 and stuff and you see you see what shit they were prepared to go through just for oil and you think you're going to get them to give up oil and the whole system of power behind oil and the monetary system behind oil and the agricultural system the whole power system based on oil you think you're going to get them to just drop it just because you've worked an efficient solar cell out and, you know, the guy on just have a think says, uh, well, we've cracked the technology, so it's going to roll out soon. It's like, what fucking planet are you on? This, this oil is intrinsically connected to the monetary system, the petrodollar and stuff. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, to, to see see what we're up against it's not about raising climate awareness and doing um yes you know reinvesting in esg and recycle reuse re, you know replace or something it's 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 you know it's total it's total war and these guys are it's a war to the death so everybody thinks well you know all these guys green guys are going to change it's like no they it's a it's a war to death with these these rich power brokers. Bill Gates or something, Elon Musk and these guys, they're not going to come round, and they're not going to turn out at the end of it to be all sweetness and light, and you know, say have deathbed epiphanies and stuff. They they powerful people that will you know that uh, on their way out they're going to take take as much. <laughs> Of this uh, living planet out, out of spite. So yeah, it's it, what's at stake is much bigger. What we 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 have so far to go psychologically to see that. I mean, this is Armageddon. This is um, always final war. You know, basically the the final act, and uh, we, we that's where we're heading for. So yeah, it is biblical, it's epochal, and it's you know it's it's been said so many times. It's it's what the Bhagavad Gita is about. It's the you know the battle of Kurukshetra, where all the parties, good and evil, eventually meet on the final Armageddon field. And so it's um you know that's that's where we're going to. It's where we're going. It is apocalyptic and. Um, Spain, not there. They still haven't got a clue what what's coming. So anyway, yeah, yeah. It's been you know it's been retold and retold. And you know, there's another scene in Moby Dick where you know one of the um, shipmates has a, uh, a a gun. It's Starbuck, I think. And he thinks about shooting Ahab, but he doesn't do it because, you know, he's in he's in one of those boxes. You know, he's a Christian. He's this, he's that. He's limited himself and limited his options. And so the, the voyage goes on. Ahab's monomaniacal insanity continues and he takes the whole ship down. And, um, you know, people that analyze this say it's because of Ahab's uh, monomaniacal behavior. It's like no, Starbuck didn't pull the fucking trigger. <laughs> he should have pulled the trigger and then took the ship back to shore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. But you see, the Ahab is in pursuit of the great white whale, and that's that's what we're in pursuit of with AI and you know this progressivism, this millenarianism, this kind of Whiggish idea that there's progress and we'll. We, we will sort all our problems out the technology it's basically it, it it's Melville's early version of the technological singularity um, so it's this rapture of the new nerds that they're all in pursuit of is, is the great white whale yeah they're trying to get the universe to answer to them but you know it's all you know it's all been said like you're talking about how like those patterns 
those patterns are in our head and we see them on the rocks and we trace them and stuff and you know all this behavior it says more about the individual person themselves than it does the universe because you know the universe is kind of chaotic it's doing noise and stuff like chaotic noise yeah really but it's, it. it's ineffable and all that well well that's that's part of the white whale as well so it's um it's a mysterious leviathan big and uh hard to understand right but yeah well i guess that's a good enough place to stop isn't it Oh, I wonder if anybody's got. I wonder if mentioning something I know about the Jungle Book will help. So you know how you said like the alien cortex inverts substitutes and all that. So I've actually read the Jungle Book and its sequel a long time ago, and uh, it doesn't turn out to be like the movie at all. So you know, in the movie, Mowgli's this little kid. He never grows up. He's kind of a spoiled brat, and he goes to the slave plantation. Right? He gets domesticated. But in the books, he actually grows up into, you know, a full grown man. He's a hunter gatherer. You know, he has the senses of a wolf and all that. And he does go to the man village, but he figures out the man village is bullshit and it's killing his animal friends. And so Mowgli brings his wolf pack and the and the herds over. He trample, you know, they trample the village. He burns the crops and he saves the few people in the village that were nice to him. <laughs> And of course, in the village, or not oh, really? man village, yeah, he burns the fucker down. It's exactly the story of Orion and Sirius, right? So he saves the few people that were nice to him. And of course, in that, well, it's a settlement, it's not a village, right? So they're doing yeah. agriculture on it. So it's a settlement. And there's a strong man there, and he's lording over everybody and giving them the rules. And Mowgli sees these rules are stupid. And then he figures out that the, that the can't, you know, the camp is hurting, you know, his animal friends. And so, he brings fire, he brings, you know, his, um, the jungle over and they burn the fucking camp to the ground. Yeah. It's really, yeah. And Disney, Disney inverted yeah. that one. Disney would not touch that with fire. Yeah. Or with, with a, with a, a hundred foot pole. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. That, I, didn't, pretty, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the books are pretty revolutionary and pretty deep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, it's like you can even but probably Richard interpret it. From, was such a, it's like, but, but I thought Richard Kipling was such an ass. He probably was. It's like Robert Frost was an ass too, but you know, he wrote some good poetry. Like, I think people that, you know, are dickheads and, you know, probably egomaniacs can write some good shit sometimes. And they probably don't even know what they're doing, right? They probably don't even have the full insight to know exactly what they're doing. I don't know. It's hard to say, but uh, yeah, Mowgli burns the fucking the camp to the ground. <laughs> yep, Jeez, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it goes well, to show yeah, how we got to Hollywood do is. more more Mowgli. Yeah, we got to do more Mowgli and less Disney. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the the system the system wants you to be that Mowgli in the movie where you never grow up. It wants you to be, you know, that spoiled little kid, you know, the swaddled, the swaddled American consumer and go to the and see that the the jungle is full of tigers and you're going to die and it's dangerous. It's like, no, Mowgli and the books drew the opposite conclusion. <laughs> yeah, the, the 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 movie was that you need to grow up and leave all the wild jungle things behind and be civilized. And that's good. So, yeah, it's a completely different message. Well, wow, that's interesting. Well, well, all right. Has anybody got anything else to say? Well, otherwise, should we end it off there? Okay. So, yeah, let's just fall still. Close your eyes. Part of the exercise of actually removing those obstacles, those nexuses of contradiction and psychological complexes in your brain is not only reflecting on what you think, but also 
just falling still and observing. And that's doing this exercise. So coming to your senses, falling still. See the light behind your eyes. And if you practice it long enough, you'll start to see phosphenes. If you keep looking at those phosphenes, those are really the precursors of you changing your neurotransmitters. And so you, you will be messing first with the occipital part of your brain, the visual part that's really linked to LSD experiences, psychedelics. And so that's the path to go is keep on looking and enhancing the phosphines till it looks like you going through a tunnel and you're following a big flower or mandala and go to that light in other words, but stay still on your meditation cushion, so to speak. Om Paramahana. Okay, everyone. Sorry about the connection problems. Thank you so much, Hugh, and everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. We and just a comment on on Tuesday. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye.